Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Fair Territory, the Thursday edition, the live edition, the one that is co-hosted by the great Alana Rizzo. Alana, it's April 11th, and I can't believe this. We have literally a ton to talk about. Ken, it seems like we've already been into about three months of the season, and you're absolutely right. So let's get right to it. But before we get to the lead, we want to make sure you guys at home get your questions in for Ken on Grill and Ken. But Ken, let's get right to it. Let's talk about an update that you have on the situation regarding Shohei Otani, and more in particular, his interpreter, uh, Ipe Mizuhara. Well, Alana, a press conference has been called for 1.30 Eastern by federal prosecutors at which they are going to announce significant developments in a criminal investigation that also carries great significance. They have not said exactly who this is revolving around, but it is understood that this is going to be a news conference regarding Ipe Mizuhara, the interpreter for Shohei Otani. And as the New York Times reported last night, Mizuhara has been in negotiations with federal officials regarding a guilty plea in this case, regarding what is expected to be him admitting to stealing money from Shohei Otani. Now, this, of course, is a major development in a lot of ways, but it's really significant in the sense that if indeed Mr. Hara admits to stealing the money from Otani and the New York Times report said it could be significantly and more than four and a half million if that's the case, it would lend credence to Otani's account that he knew nothing about what was going on with his accounts. And also, according to the New York Times report last night, in essence, the federal government believes that it has evidence that Ota uh, that Mizuhara, excuse me, changed the setting accounts or settings on Otani's accounts, changed the settings on his accounts so that Otani could not receive confirmations or information about what was going on with those accounts. That would be stunning, but this would not be the first athlete to be duped out of money, to lose a lot of money. But we have, again, significant developments coming in this case later today. And Kenny, I think it's fair to say that the fact that he is willing to negotiate to plead guilty stands to reason that if he were to go and say not guilty and then was found guilty, the sentence and the penalty could be a lot more stiff. Is that true in saying that? And also, we must understand that Ape Mizuhara was more than just a quote unquote translator interpreter. These guys do a lot more than just translate and serve as a liaison between the team and the fan base and the media regarding language. I would imagine that he did have access to those accounts so, and he did change the settings so Shohei wouldn't get any alerts or notifications. Well, Anna, it certainly has become obvious in recent weeks that Mizuhara played a far more significant role in Otani's life than simply interpreting and translating. And you're right. We know this in any case of this nature, that if you plead guilty and you cooperate with the officials that are investigating you, you generally get a more lenient sentence. Now, if it is found that Mizuhara stole a great amount of money, and four and a half million alone is a great amount of money, but even beyond that, then I would imagine the sentence will be only so lenient. And we're going to find out more, of course, as this goes on. One thing that is stunning to me about this whole matter, through it all, Otani has been incredibly unflappable, in part, perhaps, because he knows he did nothing wrong. Again, we don't know exactly what's going on here, but he has acted like he's done nothing wrong. He has said he did nothing wrong. He has not been accused of doing anything wrong. And in... The last week or so, the last seven games, he has been on absolute fire at the plate, being the Shohei Otani of old. You see the numbers right there. 433 batting, 469 on base, 967 slug, five doubles, one triple, and three homers. That's just in the last seven games. So obviously, Otani has been unaffected by this. And again, at that news conference, 130 Eastern today, we're going to find out more just about what Ipe Mizuhara might be admitting to, what he is being charged with, and where this case exactly is going. Ken, those numbers certainly don't look like somebody that's worried about some off-field stuff other than perhaps just the betrayal of a good friend and a confident. Moving on from the Shohei Otani and Ipe Mizuhara story is the story that everybody was talking about yesterday, Ken, as far as the big anticipated debut of number one prospect Jackson Holiday to the Baltimore Orioles. To whom much is given, Ken, much is expected. What did you think? 
Well, he didn't have much of a debut in terms of accomplishments on the field. He had the one RBI on the ground out in the field. There was one play that kind of got away from him, the pop-up over second base. Not an easy play. But what stood out to me on this night, this momentous night for the Orioles, in which Jackson Holiday made his Major League debut at age 20, was that some of their other number one picks from recent <laughs> years, Colton Kowser and specifically Jordan Westberg, they were even bigger heroes. Westberg had the three-run homer that was the go-ahead shot in this game. And what is so remarkable about the Orioles right now is that, yeah, Jackson Holiday's coming to join Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rushman. But it's not just those three guys. It's Westberg, it's Kowser, and there are more coming. I want to look at the drafts here in recent years for the Orioles. Jackson Holiday, he was a first overall pick. Colton Kowser, fifth overall. Connor Norby, he's a triple-A going crazy. 41st overall, second rounder. 2020, Heston Kierstad, another guy at triple-A, second overall. Westberg, 30th. Kobe Mayo, yes, he's a triple-A too, tearing it up. Fourth rounder, 103rd overall. And then in 19, the amazing draft of Rushman and Henderson. 1-1 for Rushman. He was the first pick. Gunnar Henderson, second round, 42nd overall. Kyle Stowers was a competitive balance pick. 71st overall. So those guys, the ones at AAA, are knocking at the door. And Alana, last I looked, there are only nine positions on the field. <laughs> yeah, there's no one can't to put them. possibly play all these guys. <laughs> Yeah, they're looking for playing time for all of these guys. And by the way, the Norfolk Tides, even without Jackson Holiday, could probably beat the Oakland Athletics right now. That's how deep their farm system is as far as the Orioles are concerned. Let's switch gears now, though, to another set of birds that aren't hitting, Kenny, the St. Louis Cardinals. And if you look at the numbers between Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt, it seems like the cards go as those two go. No question, they are significant players for St. Louis. And this is a big year for St. Louis, coming off that incredibly disappointing 2023 season. And the one that is more alarming to me, if it's even possible to be alarmed with the season not even one-tenth complete, would be Goldschmidt. He's 36 years old. He had a rough spring. And now it's carried into the season. And it's surprising to me to see him with a sub-600 OPS at any stretch of the season. But this is where he is right now. Arenado has been a little bit better, not much. But as you said, Alana, these two guys are pivotal to where the Cardinals want to go. And with Goldschmidt, there's an added layer as well. And this is his free agent year. And if you recall, the Cardinals and Goldschmidt put off talks on a contract extension, kind of wanting to wait and see how this went. Well, so far, at least, it's not going all that well. And if you take a look at their numbers here, this is Goldschmidt and Arenado. Goldschmidt, 182 batting average, 294 on base, incredibly low, 250 slug. That's incredibly low, too. Arnado, again, a little bit better, 245, 268, 302. That's his slash line. Goldschmidt has the one homer. It's not noted there on the graphic. Arnado, none. He's got a few doubles, but that's it. So these guys, because they are the anchors of a relatively young lineup, they need to get it going. And again, if the Cardinals are going to be the team that they envision themselves, it can't happen without Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arnato playing huge roles. Arnato has driven in five. Paul Goldschmidt has driven in just one more. Six RBI so far on this young season. And Ken, it seems like the fans at Bush Stadium, at least, are recognizing that this might not be a competitive team this season. What are you noticing about the crowds? Well, they had a low crowd the other night, one of their lowest in recent memory. And it's early in the season. Weather's not always great. You see the tweet there from Jeff Jones. He's one of the beat writers. Announced attendance for Sonny Gray's Cardinals debut, 31,972, smaller than any crowd last season, fourth smallest in the history of the newest Bush Stadium, excluding, of course, the pandemic years. That's a little bit disturbing, but it's only April. The team plays better, they'll draw. That's a great baseball town. But I, there is, in that city, a city that is incredibly loyal to that team. There is an undercurrent and kind of a loud undercurrent of... Frustration, I put it that way. And there has been some vocal outlets or vocal expressions of that frustration. John Mozeliak heard it at their fan fest. He's their president of baseball operations. So again, this is a huge year for them and a situation where once again, an outfielder that they traded, Tyler O'Neill <laughs> is going off for his new team. 
Randy Arozarena, Tommy Pham, the list goes on and on of former Cardinals outfielders who have done well elsewhere. And here's Tyler O'Neill performing so far at a high level. Again, it's really early. I can't stress that enough. But there are some signs here that make you think, hmm, this could be a little bit troubling. Yeah, Tyler O'Neill going off for the Boston Red Sox. Of course, he got into it a little bit with Oliver Marmol, the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. Perhaps a chain of scenery. Scenery was exactly what he needed. Tommy Pham is sitting on the couch right now, Ken. Perhaps he could have he helped. Is. He's team. been waiting for a job, and who knows? We'll see. With some of these teams off to less than stellar starts, some of them suffering major injuries, maybe he'll be employed soon. Yeah, Brandon Belt and Joey Votto are also like, hey, pick me, pick me. All right, let's move on now from the lead to Grill and Ken. We want you to get your questions in for Ken Rosenthal. And we're actually going to start with this one, which makes me laugh because I was like, I have no shot in the world of competing with Ken Rosenthal on this question. So I ask you, who is the most famous baseball and non-baseball phone number you have on your phone? Baseball phone number... I don't want to reveal which players I'm in contact with necessarily. <laughs> so I'll go with Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan's in there. I don't know that I've spoken to him more than once or twice in my life, but he is in there. Non-baseball player, it's a pretty thin list. In fact, it's a really thin list since this is all I do. But I did have the opportunity to speak to Brad Paisley for a story I was working on earlier about the Dodgers. And Brad Paisley would be my number one. Go ahead, Alana. You're shaking Dang your it. hand at me. Dang it. You took mine because I was oh. going to say my most famous baseball one was Ken Rosenthal. And then my Ugh. most non-famous yeah. <laughs> baseball one is actually I have two. Brad Paisley, who's a massive Dodgers fan. And you did a great article about him and in The Athletic about how the Tyler Glasnow whole situation went down. Um, my most famous non-baseball one is Eric Stone Street, the actor who's also a Ooh. Dodger fan, but is a tremendous actor, was on Modern Family. He is Cam on Modern Family. I will say this, however, just because I have Eric Stone Street's number does not mean he ever texts me back or responds to my request to have <laughs> him on the program. So just because you have someone's number in your phone does not mean they have the same reciprocity when it comes to <laughs> wanting to talk to you. All right. <laughs> Time Very now true. for our uh, more Grill and Ken if we have some questions here. If not, we can move on to Dude and Dork and we can get some questions in in just a moment. So let's move on to Dude and Dork until we can get some questions. And I ask you this, Ken Rosenthal, who is your Dude of the Week? My Dude of the Week? I'm going to go with Mike Trout. And Mike Trout is off to a great start, tied with Tyler O'Neill for the Major League lead with six homers. And this is a season that he pointed to as – a very big season for him from an individual standpoint. He came into this saying, I've got to reestablish myself. I interviewed him for Fox for a feature that we're going to have on later in the season. And he talked about getting back to himself. And he mentioned to me that he got goosebumps just thinking about what he believes he is capable of doing. So far, so good. Let's hope he stays healthy. Good to see Mike Trout being Mike Trout again. I love to be able to talk about Mike Trout. He deserves so much more than he's been given. All right. Uh, question mine is Tony Kemp. And the reason I say Tony Kemp is because you have to be some kind of class act to be DFA'd for a guy and then turn around and applaud that guy. So Tony Kemp, of course, you know, kind of the odd man, odd man out at the Orioles, uh, was DFA'd to make room for Jackson Holiday's Major League Baseball debut. So what did he do? He just had a tweet that said, in the fall of 2010, our college had a series against the Longhorns for a three-game set. Our hitting coach at the time was Josh Holiday, and his brother, Matt, brought his kid to our early practice. Well, of course, that kid is Jackson Holiday. I remember watching his son, Jay Holiday 7, with a sweet lefty swing, go get him, kid. And Ken, this is why Tony Kemp continues to get jobs. He's not a superstar in the game, but he is a class act and he is a good teammate. I loved this for Dude of the Week. Absolutely, Alana. And if you hadn't taken that, I would have taken it. He is absolutely the Dude of the Week. And it was really cool of him to put that out there because when you're DFA'd, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you expect it or not. It's disappointing. You're kind of getting fired. And yet he had the overall feel just to say, hey, this is a cool moment in the game. Yeah, congratulations on being such a class act, Tony Kemp. And you know what? It happens to the best of them. Albert Pujols was DFA'd and he's headed to Cooperstown. All right, we do have a uh, super chat um, tweet coming in here. We always appreciate that for Grill and Ken. But before we get to the question, Ken, who is your dork of the week? Well, my dork of the week, actually, I'm going to give some multiples here. 
And it goes to head of the union, Tony Clark, and to Major League Baseball. And the reason I'm giving them both Dave Dark of the Week is their dueling statements that resulted from this wave of pitching injuries. You might remember Tony Clark came out and said, we weren't consulted on the pitch clock the way we should have been. The pitch clock, we had some concerns about it and they weren't listened to, et cetera, et cetera. MLB never won to let a thing like that go. Releases its own statement, citing a study that has not even been published, that has not even been subject to peer review, claiming that the pitch clock has had no effect on injuries. As Gary Cole put it so aptly, it's like hearing divorced parents going at it. And we are so tired, all of us in the game, of this kind of thing. We've got a problem in the sport. Pitching injuries are a problem. The problem, I don't know if it even can be solved. But all of the energy from the union and from MLB should be going toward fixing the problem, not the usual sniping at each other that we've heard for years and years and years on issue after issue. The union, MLB, code dorks of the week. All right. I agree with you. And so does David Rothenberg, because he had this to say on the super chat. Daniel, excuse me. Daniel says from the MLB and PA biting each other's heads off is annoying. Should there be an outside commissioner who works as a middleman? Ken? commissioners have helped both sides in the past with things in the past? That's from Daniel Rothenberg on our super chat. What do you think about that? Should there be some sort of like mediator? <laughs> Daniel, it's a great wish. It's never going to happen. <laughs> the commissioner of baseball is employed by the owners. His task is to do their business. And at times it's going to make him very unpopular. And that's just the nature of the job. M Rob Manfred, from the owner's perspective, does his job very well. He makes them a ton of money. So you would have to get the owners to agree to this outside mediator, this person that would be in between, and it's never going to happen. You know what you should do? You should just get a really mad mom that has to separate her two kids all of the time. And she's had it up to here. And the mom brings in Tony Clark and Rob Manfred and says, you know what? This is enough. And that's it. Just bring in an angry mom to break up her children. and That'll be settled in just a matter of moments. All right. My dork of the week happens to go to the Angels' Joe Adele. I'm sure you saw this, Ken, but it was the bottom of the eighth inning. The Angels were down four to two in the game. He went to steal second base, but instead of stealing the bag, he actually overran the bag and then was tagged out causing it to be the third out of the inning. So obviously it takes away any sort of at-bats, any opportunities for that run to be driven in. I love Ron Washington's response. He said it was an embarrassment to everybody. It was a teaching moment, of course, but that cannot happen, Ken. And you know better than anybody covering this game as long as you have. I think any manager of the 30 teams can deal with a physical mishap, but not a mental mistake. You're right, Alana, but I will say this. Not every manager would attack the issue as directly as Ron Washington did. And players can't stand when managers criticize them publicly. They hate being thrown under the bus, so to speak. But at times, it's appropriate. And in this case, Ron Washington felt it appropriate and he had a classic response. You gotta get that bag, simply because of the situation of the game. It is a teaching moment. Um, hopefully that will never happen again because when you actually look at it, it was embarrassing to all of us. I love there you it. Go. I'd run through a wall for Ron Washington. And I know that players don't like to be called out publicly about this, but I also think there's something to be said for a long time baseball man with the mind that Wash has, a veteran guy in the game saying, hey, you cannot do that. I like that. I know that he probably would have liked it to be handled in the clubhouse. I'm talking about Joe Adele, but I give it, I give props to Wash on that. What's your take? I agree with you, Alana. And the other thing is to Wash didn't make it personal. He didn't say Joe Adele is a dummy or anything like that. He just said, Hey, this can't happen. And Joe Adele would agree with that. I am sure he's an engaging guy. He gets it. And yes, players don't like being called out publicly, but my gosh, this, this happened in front of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, and that's public too. So I thought it was handled well by Wash, and I would expect it's going to happen again if he sees something he doesn't like.
I mean, and if you're trying to win and you have an opportunity to win, you're down four to two, your head has to be in the game. That can't happen if you're trying to change the culture in Anaheim and prove that you can compete in the AL West. And by the way, if the Anaheim Angels don't capitalize on the fact and put out shirts that say you got to get that bag with a picture of Ron Washington's face, they've really missed the boat on this marketing opportunity. All right. <laughs> I back totally to, agree. That would be great. <laughs> back to Grill and Ken. We have a question um, next on the A's and Esti Ruiz. So what's the question? here on grill and ken if we can pull that up that would be awesome all right matthew moorhead can the a's bring back esty ken well of course they can bring him back it's a question of whether they want to bring him back at this time and they just put brent rooker on the injured list this morning and did not recall ruiz as you might remember from the time they demoted him they said they wanted him to work on certain things get on base more so he's capable of stealing more bases and i imagine that process continues it seemed odd at the time, no question. Estory Ruiz was one of their better players at the time. It had only been a few games, of course. But I do expect him back in the majors at some point this season. And as far as the A's are concerned, there are much bigger problems than when Estory Ruiz is going to be back in the bigs. Yeah, like whether they're ever going to play in a big league stadium again. All right, the next question <laughs> on Grill and Ken is regarding uh, – Major League Baseball's reigning uh, World Series champion and MVP, Corey Seager. Philip Denny has this to say. Corey Seager has yet to register a barrel, small sample size, or sign of a problem. That's a good question. Philip, it's a really good question. I was not aware of that. Seager's numbers are okay overall, his performance numbers. But not registering a barrel yet, I would say that is a little bit concerning. But keep in mind the greater context. He's coming off an abdominal surgery. And... Obviously, it takes time to recover from that. Remember, he was in the lineup opening day, and I don't know that that was necessarily expected. So I would imagine as Corey Seager gains strength and gets his feet under him, he's going to be just fine. Yeah, I don't worry about Corey too much, especially coming up in those big moments. Let me ask you another question, though, about uh, the Texas Rangers. This is a team that obviously is coming off a World Series win, but they haven't necessarily adjusted their bullpen woes. Now there's nobody better in the game to deal with it than Boach, but does the bullpen concern you? It's interesting because Bruce Bochy was asked this question, I believe two nights ago, and they have had their hiccups so far. LeClerc has not been as good as he was in the postseason for starters. I'm not concerned yet, but remember what they had to do last season. They had to put starters in the bullpen for the postseason. Heaney was one of them, of course. Dunning was another, and that's how they ultimately figured it out. They've got great performances out of Spores and LeClerc in the playoffs as well, but they had help. So what's interesting about the Rangers, and the thing we have to keep in mind is, while there's no guarantee, there is the possibility that Scherzer will be back before the end of May, DeGrom and Tyler Molly sometime in the second half. Now, we're counting on injured players. In two of those cases, DeGrom and Scherzer, older players, so who knows? But should they get to the point again where they have a surplus of starters, then you have the flexibility to do some things like moving Heaney and Dunning to the bullpen again. So let's give it time before we make a full judgment, but the early performance has been a bit troubling, yes. That's yeah, a constant uh, game of chess, Bruce Bochy. Nobody better to manage that game. The next question, as far as Grill and Ken is concerned, is regarding Robo, Robo, God, I can't speak today, Robo Umps. Joe Mama has this question. Scott, can we ask Kenny what he thinks of Robo Umps? I mean, we've talked about this a lot, Ken. This is a situation that keeps coming up, the automated strike zone, the automated ball strike zone. Is that going to happen? It's going to happen. I don't know when exactly, maybe even as soon as next season. Perhaps, I don't know exactly again how they're thinking about this. I'm in favor, but I'm in favor in a limited way. Now, I like the challenge system. This is something they're trying in the minors where you get, I don't know, three calls a game where you can challenge, and that way not everything is debated all the time. I don't like the idea of robo-umps calling the entire game. I like umpires. <laughs> I like what they do, and I think... For the most part, they do an amazing job. They're not perfect. None of us in our jobs is perfect. I send that out to everyone out there listening and watching. None of us is perfect. But there are times when they miss when you would want the ability to say, hey, 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 wait, let's look at that one again. That to me would be healthy. It would be good for the game. It would almost be the equivalent of instant replay and what it has done for plays on the bases and 
home run calls and all that. The egregious stuff you can go get. I don't believe we need full-time robo all the time, though I'm sure some fans watching games would welcome that. Yeah, I'm sure they would too, but I don't ever want anybody to lose their job over something that nine times out of 10, they get the call right. Again, nobody's perfect to your point. We have another question regarding Jordan Montgomery, actually dropping Scott Boris as his agent. Uh, This is interesting news. Apparently this is coming from Caleb Davis. Thoughts on Montgomery leaving Boris. And I had not heard this, Ken. I'm not sure if you had as well. Um, Will he, will he be uh, dropping Boris rather? I have not heard that he is dropping Boris. Now, is it possible that any player leaves any agent at any time? Yes, if you follow along with this sport, you know these guys run through agents sometimes like they run through girlfriends. So (laughs) it is possible that after a disappointing result, Jordan Montgomery will look around. It's possible Bellinger, all these guys will do the same. But I will say this, for the most part, Scott Boris' clients are remarkably loyal to him, even when they suffer less than desirable outcomes. So we'll see what happens, but I don't know that I can say I expect any Boris client to leave him. But again, I have not heard this. We'll just have to see. Yeah. And that's the thing too. It's like, okay, who, who's better? I mean, there's not many guys in the, in the game that do better for their clients as far as money and that type of thing than Scott Boris. Again, I think a lot of that too is a personality thing. I mean, how well do you gel personality wise with your agent? What's important to you? All right. One more question here as we uh, continue with Grill and Ken before we end the show. This one's on Angel Hernandez. Nick King says, Ken, why does Angel Hernandez still have a job on an MLB field? I swear I saw a meme the other day, Ken, that had an iPhone that had a picture of Angel Hernandez and it just said, missed call, missed call, missed call, missed call. Uh, Nick wants to know, how come he's still employed? This question can be from 2004, 2014, 2024. I'm not exactly sure when Angel's career began, but it's been kind of a downhill slope, right? He still has a job because the umpires have a strong union and he is still employed. And apparently firing someone for performance in this particular union is difficult to do. So obviously anyone who has watched a game that Angel's been involved with over the years, has one memory, at least one memory, of an ump show, as we call it on Twitter, where Angel kind of gets in the way of the normal course of events. I don't get it. No one gets it. I'm sure MLB will be quite happy the day he retires, but (laughs) he remains employed. Yeah, it's almost like weathermen in California. You literally cannot get fired because it's 70 degrees (laughs) every day. And if you're completely wrong, it doesn't matter. As a weather person, you don't necessarily have to be right. Um, do you have an interesting Angel Hernandez story that kind of pops out in your memory after the decades that you've covered this game? I actually don't. In fact, Alana, I can't recall ever being involved in a game where he had some kind of incident, not with Fox, not even covering as a writer. Obviously, we've written about Angel over the years, but For whatever reason, I have avoided an Angel Ump show in games that I've been covering in one form or another. Yeah, I can't say that I I have had a run in with him either. I have to ask you, what about um, any game that you've been to? You know, were you at the Galarraga, what would have been a perfect game? Uh, Anything like that that you kind of that has stood out to you in your career? Wow. Hmm. I'll put you on the spot here. Yeah, you put me on the spot. I, I don't recall an umpire situation one of the most memorable games i covered was the jose Bautista game in the 2015 division series correct me if i'm wrong out there it could be 2014 but i believe it was 2015 against the texas rangers let's just say there was a lot going on in that game and i remember blue jays fans throwing garbage into the rangers dugout and of course the night ended or climaxed with Bautista hitting that home run and that remarkable bat flip That was one of the most memorable games I've ever covered. There were a lot of things in that game that culminated in that emotional moment. But as far as an umpire screwing things up, I'll give you one. Okay. The Cardinals World Series in which I think it was against the Rangers. I don't recall exactly. Yadier Molina scored the winning run, and he scored it on an obstruction call. And it was a very obscure call. We couldn't figure out why it happened. Tim McCarver in the booth for Fox that night, he nailed it. He said, that's obstruction. He got it. But I remember interviewing Yadier and you know, Alana, you've done this a hundred billion times. 
where you got a guy coming right off the field and the game has just ended. I didn't know what had happened. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure Yadier knew what had happened and we just kind of winged it. <laughs> that was yeah. live TV, folks. <laughs> yeah, you got to love it. You just you plow forward. I uh, Yeah, I completely understand that. Well, it has been a pleasure getting to talk to you always. You're such an inf you know plethora of information. Um, thanks for being here as, and this, for, thanks for letting me be on your show. It's been fun. The I'll first what, four or five that. shows. You're the co-host. Good. Hey. <laughs> All right, guys at home and listen in on the podcast. Don't forget uh, to listen, to subscribe. Thanks for watching us. You can get us, of course, on the YouTube channel on Foul Territory, wherever you get your podcast. And Foul Tory is next right after Fair Territory. And of course, followed by Dodgers territory. There's a lot of territories. And Ken will be back with uh, Fair Territory by himself on Monday. Thanks for being with us. Have a good day.